the goal coming up this afternoon office of the special prosecutor assures public its probe into the financial status of former sanitation minister is continuing with a pledge to provide details when investigations conclude ahead though we assess the work of the former minister tax to make Accra the cleaner city in africa also former president john mahama challenges Ghanaians to maintain the moral compass of society by questioning sources of unexplained wealth Meanwhile, the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagwin, says growing erosion of public confidence in leadership portends danger for the country's fledgling democracy. We got details from an ongoing National Development Conference. Also this afternoon, Labour groups tax government to reduce inflation and maintain macroeconomic stability or risk a demand of more than 30% salary increment during their next negotiations. The teacher unions, meanwhile, are demanding the resurrection of empowerment of teachers in second cycle institutions to instill discipline following bullying incident at the saddle college we have details of these stories a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes A pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. It's streaming live on Facebook at handles 3FM927. Same handles on Twitter as well, 3FM927. I am Eric Mawinaik. But let's begin where the Office of the Special Prosecutor, because it says that it is continuing with investigations of former sanitation and water resources minister Cecilia Abenadapa and will brief the public when investigations conclude. A statement by the office this morning amidst a heightening in public interest assured of a continuous probe into the development after spending about five years at the sanitation and water resources ministry immediate past minister cecilia dapa who has now resigned was among those who tax uh, tax with bringing to fruition the president's vision of making a crowd the cleanest city in africa she was also responsible for the quest to attain sustainable development goal six which seeks to ensure the availability and sustainability sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Although she was once a minister for aviation in 2017 and a caretaker gender minister between uh, 2012, uh, 2021 and 2022, it is her time at the sanitation ministry that many will remember. But how did she fare uh, as the minister for sanitation and what areas can the new minister, Frida Prempe, improve upon? Let's get on the telephone lines. Now, Patrick Apoya is a WASH specialist and a consultant with the Coalition of Non-Governmental Organizations in Water and Sanitation, KONIWAS. Uh, Ms. Apoya, many thanks for uh, joining us this afternoon on the news. First off, she's gone. That's the former minister. What will be the general assessment of her time uh, at the ministry? Many would recall the president's vision of making a crowded cleaner city and whether or not uh, that vision is on course. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me. Mm. Uh, yeah, you, you, you rightly said it. Uh, at least, even if people will not remember anything at all, they will remember the president's uh, uh, vision to make a crowded cleaner city. And anyone who is measuring a minister at that uh, uh, level is always looking at this at the yardstick. So based on that, you could say that uh, it was very challenging for her. But beneath that, there are also a lot of things that she was able to achieve uh, very significantly. Uh, let's not forget that when we say Accra to become the cleanest city, it means each and every district assembly doing the right thing to ensure that their jurisdictions are kept clean. Now, our assemblies are, uh, they are just institutions. They don't have any budget. They don't have the capacities. They don't have. They have. They are just left on their own to fend for themselves. Uh, it is under the current way they operate. There's just no way that any assembly will be able to organize a solid waste management system to be able to meet the president's initiative. So uh, this new minister actually, having noticed that, took a step backwards to advocate for the to continue with the advocacy for the the establishment of the sanitation national sanitation authority, which will be the the, the, the a, a better body with the right capacity to be able to support the assemblies to get this vision to fruition. Unfortunately, 
that process got stuck at cabinet uh, until the president put a moratorium on the on the creation of uh, additional authorities, and it has since been stuck there. So you could say she was, she has to take responsibility because the time that we initiated the moves for the sanitation authority, uh, we have had about three authorities established since then, and yet uh, ours was not established. So depending on how well you play your politics within cabinet and in parliament, depends on how your agenda can be pushed forward. That was a very major setback uh, for the minister mm. when it comes to that particular vision. But beyond that, she put in a lot of the fundamental building blocks that would have been able to get that vision realized. Uh, in terms of the right partners, uh, getting the confidence of the private sector, uh, getting the, 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 the right strategies to be put in place. Now we have a solid waste management strategy, recognizing the informal waste collectors that we normally scorn upon and trying to formalize them into the system, recognizing that the formal waste collectors alone cannot do it. So a lot of things have been achieved behind the scenes mm. that unfortunately people cannot credit her for until you are told. Uh, on that basis, if you were to assess her, I would probably give her 65% achievement. Mm. Ultimately, she has, Accra is not a cleaner city. Uh, nobody can deny that. But behind the scenes, the work that has been done, if she got that funding that the Minister of, Minister of Finance actually denied our ministry, uh, perhaps uh, it will be a different story today. Right. You can put all the building blocks, but if that icing on the cake is not put there, for the assemblies to be able to deliver... Uh, there's no way we can make progress. Mm, so we are hoping that the new minister mm, coming, that which, is where the new minister has to continue uh, efforts. Which, to which, ensure that which was something I was coming to, that if the former minister, you're crediting here, with putting the building blocks in place, uh, many parts of a crowd today where if you go to by very busy roads, as a matter of fact, they've yeah. become refuse stamping sites. It takes yeah. a long while for all of that to be taken care of. Is yeah. it the case that now it's just a matter of finances being released for this new minister so that we can begin to see the vision of the capital becoming the cleaner city? Yes, beyond that, there's a critical institution that has to work between the ministry and the assemblies. Uh, and the ministry doesn't have that capacity. It's not well suited to deal directly with assemblies. Remember, the assemblies is under another ministry. So that's why the creation of the sanitation authority is very vital to now translate whatever resources would be realized into what we all want to see. So the, the, the area that the new minister has to put her energy in is seeing that that sanitation authority is established it comes to fruition, and then continue to mobilize the local and international partners. Uh, it's not as simple as saying it's just about money. No, there is, there is money, but the institutional hiccups are also a reality. Uh, so these are the two things that the new minister has to look at. Uh, but don't forget that the ministry's role is not just about solid waste. There's also the bit of people having access to their own uh, improved latrines at home that are used by only their household members. Mm. Right now, internationally, we are, I mean, locally, uh, I mean, in, in Ghana, only 25% of our population have toilets that are dedicated to just their households. It is very bad, very, very, very low internationally. So uh, the measures to do that, uh, we know that a lot of the poor households who don't have, right. uh, the Gamma project, which has been extended to Kumasi, she was working hard to get it extended to the north and to the western region. Uh, it's an advanced stage. I think the new minister needs to push that, to continue that agenda, and also to continue working with uh, some of the development partners and NGOs who are looking at market-based sanitation that will get uh, households to also contribute. Uh, right. Supporting the assemblies to gather their bylaws mm. so that the environmental health officers, those we used to call Sama Sama, mm. can be more effective in doing what they do. Uh, will be very crucial for the success of the incoming minister. Mr. Poya, I appreciate that you could speak to us this afternoon. Thank you. That's Patrick Apoya. He's a WASH uh, specialist and a consultant with the Coalition of Non-Governmental Organizations in Water and Sanitation speaking to us this afternoon. We're moving away from this uh, to the former president, John Mahama, because he's challenged society to question the sources of unexplained wealth as part of efforts to maintain morality. According to him, Ghana is gradually losing the values which held society together and there's a need to revisit those values. His comments come on 
on the back of ongoing investigations into a stash of cash at the residence of former sanitation minister Cecilia Penadapa. Mr. Mahama, he's been addressing the opening session of the National Development Conference organized by the Church of Pentecost in partnership with the Ghana Journalists Association. The Church of Pentecost has set the tone. And it is our, my hope that our president and our leaders will take a cue to create the opportunity for cross-fertilization of ideas on vexed issues and challenges that face our country, such as our current economic crisis and important issues like the implementation of the free SHS. Consensus building does not diminish a leader. It rather projects a leader's strength in carrying along with his vision the people that he leads. We are faced with an erosion of our traditional values and westernization of our societies and the adoption of alien cultures imported from elsewhere. And so the question one might ask is, what happened to our value of cleanliness? Why are cities so dirty? What happened to our abhorrence of greed and theft? Why? Do we celebrate persons who today are wealthy with dubious sources of income and yet society is not concerned about what the source of income is and it's only about the person's wealth? Ladies and gentlemen, ethics have a direct impact on national development. And as a student of history, I can say unequivocally that in history, all civilizations that have fallen have done so after they lost their moral and ethical compass. That's the former president, John Dermani Mahama, speaking there. We'll hear from Alban Bagwin as well, who has been speaking, but my colleague Judith Awachitando is at that event and joins us on the phone lines uh, with a bit more. Uh, Judith, tell us a bit more about this National Development Conference. Uh, we know that the former president has been speaking. The vice president is in attendance as well, as well as the former president, John Ajikum Kufo. Exactly what has been the topic of discussion and what have these different different speakers been saying? Brad and Simona, basically the theme for the program is moral vision and national development. And so um, the vice president was speaking on behalf of President Senado Dante Kufado, speaking to explain what exactly the government of the Kufado government has been doing to promote this particular theme, which is moral uh, vision and national development. And so he spoke about the fact that um, the goal of uh, his his yeah, was to improve the livelihoods of the people, and that is uh, President Anna de Dankwa. Uh, that's basically the speech which is being read by the Vice President. Um, he spoke about, he reiterated the fact that the Russia, um, uh, the Russia and Ukraine war, as well as the pandemic, the COVID 19 pandemic, had really thwarted these hopes that he wanted to bring about. And so basically, they spoke heavily about that digitalization drive which he says is what has helped promote national development as well as moral vision. He says that any society characterized by bribery will not move forward. And people here in Ghana believe that there's no accountability for their actions. And so he has enhanced through digitalization, transparency, as well as morally upright behavior. And that is being done through issues like the Ghana card, as well as the linking of... Um, different databases and so he says that from next month a baby who are born in Ghana will be issued Ghana cards exactly at the time that they are born and he says that people who are uniquely defined um, reject bad behavior so this is the reason why they want to do this now he says that um, issues like lying about your age cannot no longer happen since that um, databases are being linked together he also spoke about the fact that they have digitalized operations of many government institutions and mm. hence um, this has reduced corruption and so for instance DBLA has been digitalized, mm. ECG office has been digitalized, passport acquisition has also been digitalized. Right, and he says that uh, for instance um, they uh, found that there was a problem at ECG mm. where data for four years, uh, revenue four years of revenue at ECG was constant because the value was the same and hence the team was sent to work on it mm. and reconfigure the architecture and digitalization. They have moved from 450 million 
seeds. That was in a quite a month to one point two billion seeds. A month. So, so and quite so quite extensive happened. from from the vice president in terms of what the right. government has done. Uh, uh, the former president, John Ajikum Kufu, as well, just briefly on what he said. Right. So, right. So just a bit more on the Speaker of Parliament, who we understand has been speaking as well in relation to leadership. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, leadership has in recent times been a contentious issue in the whole world, not only in Ghana. This is due to the erosion of trust in leaders and the declining public confidence in institutions that are critical to national development. The time has come for a sober reflection on how we conduct our international and national affairs. More importantly, the politics we play. What could we be doing right or wrong? Should power be about ourselves or about the larger society that we profess we want to serve? Is power a manifestation of might, or it is about God's hands in the affairs of men? We need to take a step, a step back and consider these issues. And I believe we are gathered here to do so. We have present here leaders who impact greatly national development in its all different parts. We all, not only politicians, have a responsibility to serve our nation, our people, with integrity and facilitate the progress and development of our society. I strongly believe Ghana can work again. The Speaker of Parliament, Alban Simana Kinsford Bagbin there, and was staying from the subject or moving rather from the subject matter to another having to do with labor because organized labor they've called on government to reduce inflation and maintain macroeconomic stability or risk uh, demanding more than 30 percent salary increment at uh, the next negotiations which will be done from next week government and organized labor uh, to begin meeting from next week for public sector workers on the single spine salary structure and general secretary of the health workers or health services Workers Union, Franklin Ousu, he's been speaking to our Labour correspondent, Daniel Opoku, on their expectations ahead of this. Whilst we got that 30%, inflation was around 50%. It means you have not even restored the individual of his take-home salary. And that is a challenge. If government have anything to do, they should work to better the macroeconomic indicators and to make sure that these indicators are good. Even if you get a little, Assuming we get 10% and inflation is at 5% or 6%, then you know that you have restored what you can buy and you even have an addition of, let's say, uh, 4 or 5%. Mm. But if you give me 30% and inflation is at, is at 50, then it means I have deficit of 20 to finance. Mm. And so no matter how, uh, how high the percentage is that you get for your members, they will still not be happy because inflation has taken away your real uh, income. So what would you propose? I would like you to see more than 30% being taken. I will not be able to say that for now because uh, you know that organized labor will do our things in an organized way. And so once we have not met, I will not be able to put forth any percentage that this is what we are looking for. Yeah. But we want to hear maybe uh, good economic indicators coming from the media review, which will also push into the negotiations. If we are able to get our inflation and other macroeconomic indicators down, mm. we will also go with a lower figure. But if they stay high, then we are compelled to also uh, take a higher percentage to the table. Right. That's the General Secretary of the Health Services Workers Union, Franklin Owusu, and from one labor group, we're going to 
two more, this time on the education front, because the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAD, and the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAT, they've, resur they've resurrected calls for the empowerment of teachers in second cycle institutions to instill discipline among students. It follows a viral video in which uh, a fellow student at a decided college who appears to be older was seen pushing another student in the face and almost strangulating him. The president of NAGRAD, Angel Kabuno, and the general secretary of NAT, Thomas Musatanku, they tell 3FM that the powers need to return to the teachers so that they can control such activities. It is up to us, all stakeholders, to identify the problem and then head on find solutions right. Teachers or school management should be empowered to the extent that they can stamp it out of our schools. You see, when the Ghana Education Service some time ago announced wide changes in how students are disciplined, significantly the taking out of the corporal punishment without necessarily replacing it with any effective means of uh, sanctions, we have now what we have in our schools because there seems to be a vacuum when it comes to ensuring that students are disciplined. Okay? As we speak, because you, you cannot repeat students, I'm calling for empowering school management and authorities to put in play disciplinary measures to deter some of these errant behaviors. That's what I'm calling for. So that when the students and the parents and the beneficiaries of education know that school management do have the authority to sanction erring students, and the sanctions concomitant with the offense that they commit, then people will begin to see that, no, this is a no-go area. I think that where we are now, we've all contributed to it. Because whenever teachers take action against students, they always receive condemnation. That is why we are here. And I think last week, the GES came out with a draft. We have made some contributions into it. And we are hoping that uh, sooner or later, uh, the uh, code for students will soon be published. We will urge parents to also talk to their walls. That you go to school to go and learn. You don't go to school to go and beat somebody's word. You don't do that as a student. And they should put an end to it. But because these students' uh, final years are involved, GGS should expedite action on whichever investigations they are doing so that whichever punishment we meted out we meted out quickly but whichever punishment that will be meted out should not prevent the boys or those involved from writing their final exams never so you had the the Thomas Musa Tanku and Kenali Awudu as well as Angel Kabunu all speaking in relation to the development at Adisado College. Unfortunately, we're built to speak to Cassandra Chumampofu. She's a public relations officer of the Ghana Education Service, but uh, we're unable to connect with her. Uh, we'll try. Uh, in the course of the bulletin to bring her perspective to you on this matter, particularly on the calls by the teachers to have some form of authority return to them and also get updates because we know that yesterday the education minister uh, did express some concern in relation to this and had uh, a called for a meeting uh, to get a bit more insight even as the Ghana Education Service commences investigation into the development. But you're listening to the news here on 3FM. 92.7 streaming live on Facebook. Our handles 3FM927. Same handles on Twitter as well. 3FM927. Let's take you to Kumasi now, where the trial uh, of the trial rather is expected uh, to begin in the murder case involving a police officer in Kumasi. Inspector Ahmed Chumisi was being charged with the murder of his girlfriend Majwa pleaded not guilty in his last court appearance. Let's cross over to the Kumasi High Court where my colleague Ibrahim Abubakar is on standby with a bit more details as to exactly what it is that's happening in the court. Ibrahim, talk to us. Has the trial begun? Describe to us as well the mood and the look and feel of the court because we know that this continues to be a very controversial uh, subject matter there. Well, that's the Mauna. So, Inspector Amel Chumefi was brought in not too long ago. Uh, initially, we thought um, he would come by 10 a.m., but it was just around 12 that 
and he was brought in by the prison's officers because, you know, he's in the custody of the police. And the atmosphere has always um, looks a bit charged, just that um, different from the initial stages where people come in and making noise and crying and a lot of things. But still we have a, a number of family and friends who have trooped in the, to the court um, to observe what is happening. So um, for now, the trial has begun. Uh, we don't know exactly because I've stepped out of the court briefly. But um, for them, they are hopeful that at the end of the day, justice will be served. You know, the last time, um, that was last week when Inspector Chumesi was to appear before the High Court for the first time. He came all right, but he didn't have any legal representative. So the judge had to adjourn the case to today. Um, today, fortunately, he came here with his legal representative, and he is trying to see whether he can secure bill for him. But for now, until they are done with the case, we, we can't tell whether the bill will be granted or not. Ibrahim, just staying on uh, a little longer, having to do with the Zongo youth who've issued a statement in relation to yet another death recorded at the hands of the police allegedly. Uh, they've issued, unfortunately, we have lost Ibrahim Abubakar on the telephone lines. We're just seeking to get uh, a bit more details uh, from the Zongo Youth Association in the Ashanti region who've issued a statement in relation to... Uh, the alleged killing of a young man at Asawasi, and they say that the constant killing of the Zongo youth is becoming uh, the promotion of the barbaric act by the police to continue to victimize persons within the Zango communities and oh, seek to connect with uh, Ibrahim Abubakar again pretty shortly, but let me just walk you through uh, portions of that statement where they say that they are of the strong view that the approach as a society towards such unlawful killing of their youth in Zongos isn't serious enough to let the government know and understand how bitter and angry they are whenever the people are innocently killed by uh, irresponsible policemen. Now, over the years, they say that Islamic clerics, chiefs, CSOs and politicians have championed a strong campaign against lawlessness amongst the Zongo communities, hence amplifying the need for the Zongo youth to be law-abiding. Uh, however, it is beginning to look as though the police is taking their compliance to the laws as a weakness to take undue advantage over them to kill and deprive the Zongo youth from getting the goals of or getting to their destination. And so an area of concern, one that we'll look out for a bit more to get details on if you stay with us here on 3FM 92.7. But also in relation to a number of things that we'll be keeping an eye on for you today is uh, trials or sittings or meetings, if you can call it that as well, by the National Labor Commission in relation to a number of issues uh, brought before it by uh, labor groups. And so there is the Senior Staff Association of Ghana, uh, UCC chapter uh, against the University of Ghana, we know that they are threatened to lay down their tools in relation to, amongst many things, uh, some conditions of service and the likes. And then as well, the Internal Audit Agency and the Public Services Workers Union having to do with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and uh, some monies or allowances which was described as illegal and there was that order from the National Labor Commission to have it all reversed. Uh, we'll follow up on all of these and bring you details of, uh, of all of them if you stay with us here on 3FM 92.7. But amongst many things as well, there were top uh, liners for you this afternoon uh, where uh, the Office of the Special Prosecutor has said that it will provide timely details of ongoing uh, probe into the financial status of former sanitation and water resources uh, minister Cecilia Abna Dapa. We've been hearing as well from the former president John Mahama who's been asking Ghanaians to maintain the moral compass of society by questioning sources of unexplained wealth. The speaker of parliament uh, meanwhile says that the growing erosion 
of confidence in leadership portends danger for the country's fledging democracy. In other matters, though, 3FM Sunrise, they're coming your way uh, this Friday, the 28th of July, from the thriving Medina market. And so be our guest as we highlight the challenges of the people of Lankwantana Municipal Assembly and provide a platform for the people to speak out on their development concerns to the people in authority. So listeners and the live show participant can also win attractive cash prizes in the 3FM Loyal Listener Game, a raffle draw that will see listeners receive cash awards for their dedicated leadership. And so that's also one of the newest things that we'll be bringing to you in the coming weeks uh, for your dedicated listenership here on 3FM as well as on TV3. But that's our bulletin for you this afternoon, uh, which came to you live from our studios here at Adesawe Kanda. A lot more news as always if you log on to 3news.com. The business team ready and on standby to bring us the very latest from the world of business. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. As always, log on to 3news.com for a lot more news. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Business Daily. Coming up, total money, mobile money transactions projected to hit 1 trillion cities by the end of July 2023. We will hear from the Bank of Ghana. And energy strategist Dr. Yusuf Suleimana renews calls for urgent review of government's gold for oil policy. I am Bismarck Aousa. will bring you details of these stories and many others shortly. Thanks for staying with us. Now to our very first story. Total mobile money transactions reached a record 859 billion cities in the first six months of 2023, data from the Bank of Ghana has revealed. This is compared with 480 billion cities during the same period in 2022. The Bank of Ghana has revealed that if the trend continues, the total, money, the, the total mobile money transactions will hit 1 trillion cities by the end of July 2023. There is more in the following business desk report. The total mobile money transactions for June this year is almost double compared with 480 billion cities recorded during the same period in 2022. The volume recorded for January this year stood at about 130 million Ghana cities, growing steadily, with June recording almost 150 million Ghana cities worth of transactions. The Bank of Ghana has revealed that if the trend continues, the total mobile money transactions will hit 1 trillion cities by the end of July 2023. The impressive growth in mobile money transactions comes despite the 1% electronic transfer levy. From the data, Mobile money transactions have increased since the implementation of e-levy in May 2022 at 1.5% rate. On January 11, 2023, after public uproar, the government reduced the tax rate on electronic transactions from 1.5% to 1%. Despite the growth in mobile money transactions, revenue has been well below the government's expectations as it has consistently failed to meet its target. However, the growth in mobile money transactions is a positive sign for the Ghanaian economy. It shows that people are increasingly using mobile money to pay for goods and services, which is helping to boost financial inclusion. It's a business desk report by my colleague Michael Obodu. In a related development, cybersecurity firm eCrime Bureau has, this, has stressed the need for increased education among mobile money users to help check fraud. This comes after a report, a report by the Bank of Ghana that revealed that Money's lost to mobile money fraud increased by over 100% in 2022. Reacting to this development, the lead for financial crimes and anti-money laundering, laundering bureau, 
Eric Kwekumensa expressed concern. 2021 success rate for mobile money fraud incidents was 90.14%. And then the 2022 success rate was 96.30%. It sends a signal. That means that the criminals have found a way to, you know, withdraw the cash. And that has accounted to the success rate. You know, as much as the fact that the uh, attempted fraud or the actual losses have actually also significantly increased. So uh, it's very important that, you know, institutions put in the right processes, particularly when it comes to incidents response. So when a fraud occurs and then uh, it's reported to the telecommunication organizations, there should be a way to swiftly respond to it. And uh, per our analysis, you realize that the modus operandi has now become very sophisticated. And most of them, or a majority of them, being social engineering you know, uh, oriented. So if there's a need to increase awareness so that uh, you know the population or the citizens will be aware of the schemes because they keep on changing. That was lead for financial crimes and anti-money laundering at e-crime bureau, Eric Kwikumensa. To some other story, energy strategist and chief executive of Eureka Energy Solutions, Dr. Yusuf Suleimana has described as a defeatist stand the notion that palm prices could have been worse without the gold for oil policy. He has, however, raised concerns about the effectiveness of the program in mitigating the impact of rising fuel costs on consumers. His comments follows the Bank of Ghana's stance on not reviewing the policy, which is contrary to the IMF directive. Over the time, I believe we haven't seen that. And even after the rollout of the policy, we've seen fuel prices went up several times in several windows and with some questionable. Uh, you know, reductions in, in some windows. And of course, that also fed into the dynamics within the international market. Uh, because by, bear in mind, it's not only the fuel prices, I mean, it's not only the exchange rate, we also have the international dy dynamics that, that will play a major role. And so, and to the extent that at this moment in time, I don't feel where I sit that uh, the gold for oil has, has had that massive impact, you know, on the pump prices. We may argue that probably it has stabilized the, the CD that stabilize the currency and stuff like that. But if you argue that way, I, I, I want to say that it will be a kind of a defeatist position in a way that, I mean, we wanted to have, I mean, to get it to reduce prices at the pump, and we are not seeing that much. And so until we see the goal for oil having substantive impact on reduction in prices at the pump, um, that, 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 that it will be very difficult to, to convince people the efficacy, how uh, the potency, you know, of the policy. That was energy strategist and chief executive of Eureka Energy Solutions, Dr. Yusuf Suleimana. Moving on, the Ghana Stock Exchange has described the low patronage of the Ghana alternative market as a worrying trend. Since its establishment in 2013, only six businesses have listed on the market. Speaking to three business at a Women, Women Investment Summit Africa conference and exhibition in Accra, head of listing and new products at the Ghana Stock Exchange, Joyce A.C. Boachi said, the alternative market afford companies, including startups, the opportunity to secure long-term capital. Taking advantage of this market is, is very important and it's, it's, it's readily available. I mean, the market is there. We want entrepreneurs in this country to take advantage of this market. Currently, we have only six companies listed on this market since 2013 and it, it's not encouraging. One issue we have realized is that some of them do not want to share, do not want to open up for others to come in. But we give them the comfort because the regulations or the rules says that um, the minimum you can give to outsiders is 25% of your company. So if you own 75% of a company that, that is worth billions of Ghana cities, isn't it better than owning 100% of a, a company that is millions of, of cities, or even not millions, you know? So this affords them the opportunity for the company to be big and own big, you know, percentage in this in this um, institutions, even as they give, you know, shares to others to come in. That was head of listing and new products at the Ghana Stock Exchange, Joyce A.C. Boache there. Before we go, businesses have been urged to form strategic alliances by pooling resources and expertise to produce and supply goods that meet demand of the burgeoning markets under the AFCFTA. According to a trade finance specialist at the National AFCFTA Coordination Office, Divine Kutoche, there is a need for value addition to raw materials to mitigate the risk of businesses folding up.
If after it's going to work, we are not going to be trading raw materials for raw materials. You are not going to be trading to raw tomato to Burkina Faso. They also produce the same thing. But where you add value, and that can only be acquired when you provide them the requisite training and capacity building. Um, one of the things that we are at this program that is happening is one of the things that we, we encourage where women form groups and then try to provide a platform where they can learn together. Another relevant thing we're also looking at is partnership. In Ghana, we always have the mentality of me alone, me alone, I mean, in my corner. But we are trying to build the capacity of these ladies or these women so that they can begin to form good corporate groups or associations where they can begin to feed the market. You know, Ghana's population is just, or Ghana's market is just 30 million. I mean, we are looking at 1.3 billion market. You alone cannot supply that. There is a need for you to form some close partnerships so that when the orders come, you can be able to feed into, into the, the, the needs of the market. It's not just a matter of going to the market. They need to be very competitive. If not, they'll fold up. And that will be all for Business Daily with me, Bismarck Awusa. For more news, you can log on to 3news.com.